What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Duke Wisdom Podcast. It's uh, it's April now. It's April now, and uh, there is a uh, Tobacco Road team still playing in the Final Four, and it's not Duke or Carolina. <laughs> we we're living in an alternate dimension this year, apparently. Uh, the you know state man, I mean, come on, Every, everybody knows what they're doing at this point. The 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 Wolf Pack have just been on this this miracle run and i i won't even lie to you man i i I tweeted something during the duke state game in the elite eight you know obviously you're listening to this no secret (laughs) that that duke has bowed out of the tournament now but yeah i tweeted something where i was like you know shout out to state you know good luck to them uh this is a truly likable team and honestly i'm not sure how you can't can feel differently than that right because that that team's just got that 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 joy, such a joy to them. That I it's I think really easy, and of course you're going to be upset when when your guys lose in the NCAA tournament. No matter what round it's in, you're going to be upset when it happens, and it happens most years, right? You know, and, and you can't consider a season a failure when it happens. And I think it's really important that we don't consider this Duke team a failure. And I'll get into that more later. But, I mean, it's difficult to root against that state team. I mean, they they interviewed Kyle Filipowski in the locker room after the game, and he was just like, you know, even when DJ Burns beats you, you you just got to like that guy. You can't really root against him. It's so difficult to root against that guy, right? And it's so difficult to root against that whole team. Um, they're fun to watch, man. You know, they, they took Duke out, but I, I feel like that so many people here in the state of North Carolina, Carolina fans, Duke fans, I mean, state has directly stripped potential banners out of both Cameron Indoor Stadium and the Dean Dome. And I feel like a lot of Duke and Carolina fans, maybe not all, but a lot of them, they want to see the pack win, man. They want to see the pack win. And, and I think the sentiment here is that you know, state's not consistently disrupting the success of Duke and Carolina, right? That's that's not really a fear for 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 Duke. I mean, state did get Brandon Huntley uh, Hatfield in the uh, in the portal from Louisville, which I think is a pretty good get actually for Kevin Keats, and especially impressive that they pulled that off while they're prepping for the Final Four. But I don't think that you know Duke and Carolina fans are terribly concerned about NC State. Uh, becoming a power and taking some of their mojo. It feels, and everybody's endlessly making these comparisons because I, I feel like, how can you not? It feels like 1983, man. It just does. And so states, they've got that going for them. You know, is this going to continue for years to come? Almost certainly not, especially because of how many of these players um, run out of eligibility after this year. But it just feels like it, right? For me, I'm just like, how can you look at DJ Horn and not see uh, Derek Wittenberg looking at, you know, like how can you look at DJ Burns and not see Lorenzo Charles? Not because of the way they play. The way they play isn't necessarily the same at all. But how can you not look at some of these guys and their roles and see a little bit of of that 83 team in so many ways and just the way they've done it? I mean, down to the beating Virginia in the ACC tournament, and then playing them again in the Elite Eight, you know, intra-conference foe, and then moving forward into the Final Four with that win. And they did the same thing. We, but Duke was on the receiving end of it, unfortunately. And so that's where I'm, where I'm getting, you know, going with this. Uh, and, and heck, I'll make another comparison. That, uh, say what you will about Kevin Keats, whether you think he's a good coach or not, <laughs> um, and whether you think this is just luck or not. Uh, Kevin Keats is a very likable guy, uh, and he has a very um, inviting personality. I'm not going to say he's as charismatic as as Jim Valvano, but he's got some charisma to him. There's no doubt about it. Um, but but getting that back to that point, I mean, some might say that Virginia never winning a national title while Ralph Sampson was there as a failure. I, I can see somebody making that argument, but I think that it's a it's a sore argument to say that they failed because they lost to state. I think it's a sore argument to say that Houston in 1983 with Akeem Olajuwon and Clyde Drexler, Phi Slamma Jamma, I think it's off the mark to call them a failure because they lost to that state team. I, and I think it's off the mark 
to call this Duke team a failure because they've lost to this NC State team. This NC State team is a buzzsaw, an absolute buzzsaw right now. Like, I, I don't think there's a single, I think there are two teams in the entire field of 68 that I confidently believe have a chance at beating Purdue. Those two teams are UConn and NC State. Just because of the mojo they have as a team, there's one team I think even has a remote shot at knocking off UConn and its state. I'm not saying that'll happen. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Purdue beat State by 20. But I also wouldn't be surprised if State wins the game. And I won't be surprised if State beats, wins the national title. I won't be surprised if anything happens to State. There's so, I think they've got so much going for them that it could continue indefinitely and, and they could hang the national championship banner. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, they used up that last bit of mojo. Nine straight uh, wins in elimination games is ludicrous. Uh, and the fact that they've already done that and made it to their fourth Final Four in school history is crazy enough as it is. And not only them, but their women's program as well uh, in the Final Four at the same time is crazy. And so I wouldn't be surprised. And, they've, and it's unfortunate for State that they've made the Final Four and to win the national title, now they'd have to beat the top two teams in the country to do so. And I think it's a little unfortunate that that's the way it's panned out for them. But that's the way it's panned out for them. It's, it won't be easy. But I think with the amount of momentum they have, I, I certainly think we can't rule it out. I wouldn't call them the favorite. I would certainly, if I'm betting, man, I'm still putting money on UConn, right? UConn just looks unbeatable at the moment. They truly do. And I think they're certainly the best team in the country no matter what happens. But I think that... There's a high probability that UConn wins the national championship. And I think that, you know, more likely than not, Purdue wins that that game. But I'm looking forward to a Zachy D, DJ Burns matchup. You know, I think uh, ideally Edie can just kind of shoot right over DJ Burns, right? And Burns can't athletically challenge that like Mo Diara, Muhammad Diara can. Uh, but Diara's is kind of skinny and Edie's going to have his way a little bit in that matchup. Ben Middlebrooks is going to get in foul trouble really easily against Zach Eady, uh, and Diara might as well. Burns probably will, too. Everybody does. He's got a phenomenal whistle on his side. <laughs> Not to discredit Edie at all. He's a fantastic player, um, and almost unstoppable on the college level. But I, I have to wonder, you know, in that battle of the bigs, how easy is it going to be for Zach Eady to move DJ Burns, right? And then on the other hand, you know, DJ Burns has this finesse, this way to get around and in th- this way to muscle everybody in. He just, you know, just muscle ball right down the boom, boom, boom right into you. But like, can he do that with Zach Eady? I-, I don't know. And so part of me thinks that the key to this state Purdue game is going to be guard play. It's can state's guards make shots. DJ Horn's going to have to ball out against the Boilermakers. No doubt about that. Uh, anyway, that's I don't want to make this the, the, the Wolf Pack Wisdom Podcast. Uh, this is, in fact, the Duke Wisdom Podcast. So let's let's get back to the Blue Devils. I think, you know, state's the hot topic. And obviously, they're a very relevant topic for Duke because they're the team that ended the Blue Devils season. You know, Duke got to the Elite Eight with a path of 13 seed, 12 seed, one seed, and then got an 11 seed, in the Elite Eight. So in four games, they played 11, 12, and 13 seeds, as well as a number one seed who they beat. And I'll talk about that game as well. But, you know, it's disappointing, I think, to lose to an 11 seed. No matter how hot they are, it's got to feel a little disappointing. And it's even more disappointing when it's uh, a sort of rival in, in the state, you know, do. For for so long, it took Duke to even play an uh, intra-conference foe in the NCAA tournament. The first time it ever happened was in 2001 against Maryland in the Final Four. Duke won that game. It didn't happen again for 17 years until the conference had you know, been expanded with the Big East additions. And, and they play Syracuse in the Sweet 16 in 2018, and they get a win there. Then the very next year, they play Virginia Tech in the Sweet 16. And then the very next time Duke is in the tournament is when they play Carolina in the Final Four. Obviously, they dropped that one. And then now, two years later, they played State in the Elite Eight, and they've lost that. So now in three years, or three tournaments, the span of two calendar years, Duke has lost to two of its Tobacco Road rivals in in extremely important NCAA tournament games. They're 0-2 in those games now. And the craziest part is that they've now played an intra-conference foe in four of their last five tournament appearances. The only time it hasn't happened 
uh, since 2018 was last year's tournament. And that's just crazy how, how much more common it is to see those matchups. But Duke is now, you know, after starting those matchups with a win on Maryland and Syracuse and Virginia Tech, so 3-0, and now they've lost the last two, and they've lost the last two to rivals, which is that's a tough pill to swallow, I think, if you're Duke. This one's a lot easier of a pill to swallow than, than the Carolina 2022 game was, but still not easy. Um, and when you look at that game, it was that was a tough first half, but it looked a lot like the Houston first half, you know, against Houston. That was an ugly game. Duke was just, you know, barely up uh, at, at the break. And it was like, what, 23 to 21 or whatever. Um, I don't remember the exact score, but it was extremely, you know, close, but extremely low scoring at the half. And then everybody's going to say that the only reason Duke beat Houston is because Jamal Shedd got injured. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Duke would have won that game if Jamal Shedd played the entire game. I don't know that. I I, I can't tell you either way whether Duke would have won or lost if Jamal Shedd uh, had, had played in that game. Want to join a community of Duke accounts publishing news, theories, and predictions on Duke athletics? Join the Duke Wisdom Network. Just go to dukewisdom.org slash join network today and fill out the form with your name and social media. Or you can DM at Duke underscore wisdom on Twitter or Instagram. Become a part of the community of Duke fans publishing their takes today. Again, that's dukewisdom.org slash join network to DM at Duke underscore wisdom on Twitter or Instagram. But what I can tell you is, is that Duke did win the game without Jamal Shedd there. I mean, you can say if, ands, and buts, you know, all you want. That's just, you have to deal with, with the hand you're dealt. Sometimes you're dealt the bad hand, and sometimes you're dealt the good hand. Uh, I'll, I'll cite a sort of non-Duke example of this. You know, I'm a, I'm a massive Milwaukee Bucks fan. And in 2021... Kevin Durant's toe just happened to be on the three point line on a buzzer beater at the uh, or near buzzer beater at the end of regulation in game seven. If Kevin Durant wore a size 14, the Brooklyn Nets would have won that series. He wears a size 15. His foot was on the line. The Bucks end up winning a championship. Likewise, Kyrie Irving got hurt in that series. You know, the help of those two things likely handed the Bucks their first championship in 50 years. They were on the good side of, of luck. The very next year, Chris Middleton slips in the Chicago Bulls series. He gets hurt. He's out the rest of the playoffs. The Bucks, you know, losing a game seven the next series against Boston. And I happen to think, you know, if Middleton's there for that series, Milwaukee certainly wins it. And so it's, it's all about the good and the bad side of luck. And that's just how sports goes. Complain about it, you know, whatever. But also there's the end of the day that it's not like Jamal Shedd was out there killing Duke before he got hurt. He's a fantastic player, a first team All-American. I hate that he he got hurt in such a big game. Uh, I loved the sportsmanship from the Duke guys to go up and and dap him up on the bench uh, after the game. And also in the kind of the tunnels back near the locker room later when Shedd was was leaving the, the stadium and. Some of the Duke guys were in towels <laughs> in that video, man. They had just taken a shower. Uh, so that's that post shower dap up. But, it, you know, I like the sportsmanship there. Uh, I, and I respect Shed. I think he's a great player. But at the end of the day, it's not like he was having his way with Duke before the injury. And I, that's not to say that he couldn't in the rest of that game, but you can't change it. And Duke got that win, and Duke got a, a massive win. It's its first victory over a higher seeded team in 30 years. And Duke, uh, that is also, I believe, the lowest seeded Duke team to ever make the Elite Eight period this season. Four seed. Four seed is the lowest seeded Duke basketball team to ever make it to the Elite Eight. Duke has made the Elite Eight 24 times in school history now, um, losing seven times. And... Um, you know, when you think about the seven times that it happened, Duke lost the very first time, actually, it went to the Elite Eight, which was in 1960, and didn't lose again in the Elite Eight until 1980. And then the very next time they lost would be another 
18 years in 1998. So it was almost 20 years in between each Elite Eight loss. And then that remained somewhat consistent between that one and the next one, which was 15 years until they lost in the Elite Eight in 2013. But from 2013 on, hasn't been quite as uncommon for Duke to lose in the Elite Eight, dropping in a heartbreaker to Kansas in 2018, and then another heartbreaker in 19 to Michigan State, and now to, to NC State here in 2024. Duke has actually lost now uh, four of its seven Elite Eight losses coming since 2013, and they have now lost in the Elite Eight in three of the last four, or the last five, sorry, three of the last five tournament appearances for Duke have ended in an Elite Eight loss. So a massive win against Houston in which we saw a lot of toughness, a lot of grit, some solid shot making in the second half from Jeremy Roach, some March. We, have, we didn't get a lot of March Jeremy Roach this year. He had a very down period of his of his career there in March and what is probably the end of his Duke career, um, which is unfortunate. But he did hit some big shots in that second half against Houston, a much better offensive second half. But what we saw defensively was extremely impressive for, for Duke for three and a half games. You know, they held Vermont to 47, James Madison to 55, and Houston to 51. They were av- Their opponent was averaging just 51 points per game through three, and then NC State only scores 21 in the first half of the Elite Eight game, and it was 27-21 Duke at the half. It, just terrific defense for three and a half games, and then State scores 55 in the second half. And like, what are you going to do, man? What are you going to do? Um, I will say that for this State team, if you're going to beat them, beat them. Like, you've got to put them into the dirt in the first half, like 15 point deficit. Um, because it, the moment you give this team hope, this team is hope. That state team is hope. The moment you give them a glimmer, if you give them the lead in the second half, I'm not so sure that that game's extremely winnable anymore, honestly. And once the second Duke gave up its lead, when state took a one point lead, I was like, I don't know how many minutes left, anywhere from 11 to 14 minutes. Um, around that point, that's kind of when I knew. I knew Duke wasn't going to win the game for a while. I knew Duke wasn't going to win the game. And then everything just sort of spiraled out of control from that point. Uh, and State got everything it wanted. And the only Duke player that could get anything was Jared McCain, who had 32 points. 32 points in what could be his last Duke game. Uh, he had a 30-plus game twice in the tournament, in his four tournament games. And he tied Zion Williamson's freshman scoring record at Duke in the NCAA tournament with 32 points. And he has two of the top three freshman scoring games in the NCAA tournament for a Blue Devil. So a terrific performance by Jared, but it was all for naught. He didn't hit shots early when they as many as he could have maybe when it mattered and nobody else could hit shots, period. Duke, Duke struggled to hit shots when they could have buried the game early. They did a Great job defensively, and if they had hit shots and buried State early, that game probably would have been completely different. Duke could have been up anywhere from 15 to 20 points at the half. I truly believe that. And if they were, I I, I think that Duke would be in the Final Four on Saturday. Um, But they didn't. They weren't able to hit those shots. And some people uh, are blaming the, the, quote, inflate gate which I think there's certainly some truth to the fact that in this NCAA tournament in several locations, the balls have seemed uh, a bit overinflated, uh, dribbling a little too high. A lot of teams that are good three-point shooting teams missing uh, an abnormal amount of three-point shots. And Duke is a team that more or less a lot of the times lives and dies by its three-point shot. And so if you've got this external factor that's affecting three-point shooting, it's going to negatively impact Duke quite a bit. And I think we saw that. I think there, there might have been a little bit of truth to that, but I'm not blaming the loss on that. Um, I'm kind of blaming the loss a little bit on the fact that Duke just couldn't get it going offensively early when they needed to. And that's 50% of it. I think the other 50% is just pure destiny uh, on State's part that they're just, they were just built. They, it was their moment. It was their moment. It always was, I think. Um. There is, I, I don't have a lot of complaints uh, about the way 
do game plan things necessarily aside from when flip got into a little bit of foul trouble that the solution was to put ryan young on a because i i like playing burns one-on-one i think that's the correct solution you don't want to give up looks to everybody else um but the solution was not ryan young defending him one-on-one because i think i've now seen ryan young play dj burns five times and However many possessions that has been one-on-one, I'm pretty sure DJ Burns shoots 100% on Ryan Young. It feels like I've literally almost never seen DJ Burns miss when his primary defender is Ryan Young. So that's just a bad decision. And I think it needed to be, and it should have been, Sean Stewart defending DJ Burns as a primary one-on-one defender because he was the recipe for success for Duke. And there are even glimpses in that Elite Eight game where he defended him and was able to bat a pass away. Filipowski was never able to front Burns, get around him, you know, the, he and Ryan Young just didn't have the speed and the athleticism to get around, poke those passes away, uh, or block Burns' shot when 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 all else fails. Stewart can do that. And I think it was a misstep not to use Sean Stewart more in that game. I think that that would have benefited Duke a great deal. I really do believe that. So if there's a misstep, that's where it is. Uh, another comment on the state game is... In terms of Kyle Filipowski's career, I tweeted something when he fouled out. It was like, I hate that that's his last, almost certainly his last possession. Uh, and thanks for a great career. And there's a lot of pushback on that. And I know that a lot of the pushback on it was because of the frustration of losing a tournament game always makes fans say the most outlandishly negative things that night. You're never, almost no fans are reasonable the night they lose an NCAA tournament game. And I understand that. And a lot of Duke fans have turned the, the page and the reasonable people ha- have have risen back up and been like, look, dude, this was an Elite Eight season. I, it doesn't matter if they were ranked second preseason. Preseason rankings mean absolutely nothing. This team was still very young um, outside of Roach and, and, and Ryan. And, you know, it it wasn't constructed in perhaps the, the best possible way. It roster wise, but it had so much talent and it was still a very good team. And I, and the NCAA tournament is such a hard thing to predict and be like, oh, well, it's such a concrete thing. Number two team preseason, you have to make it to the championship game. Come on. I mean, really? Right. You know, like that's not the recipe for success. And it, it's not as cut and dry to this team went to the final four. So they're better or this team, you know, whatever. It's not that cut and dry, man. Right. That's, that's just not how it is. Uh, I, I don't think you can view this team as a failure, and I don't think you can view Kyle Filipowski's career as anything but great. A, a consensus All-American, one of 33 Blue Devils all time to be a consensus All-American. He was ACC Freshman of the Year last season. He was the ACC Tournament MVP. He was a two-time All-ACC selection, the first player, I think, since Nolan Smith. No, not since Nolan Smith. I'm tripping. Since I think Grayson, since Grayson Allen, uh, Quinn Cook also did it, so did Seth Curry. Uh, but to be a two time All ACC selection, uh, he might be the only Blue Devil to be a two time All ACC selection uh, and only play two years, assuming that he's entering the NBA draft. He will be one of two Blue Devils all time to be a 1,000 point plus scorer and play only two or less years at Duke, the other being Luke Kennard. Uh, he's Got, he, he's got so much decoration to his career, and he might add lottery pick onto that as well. He was playing out of position, something that I think Duke fans often didn't take into consideration enough. He was not a perfect player. He is not a perfect player. He will not be a perfect player, and that's fine. He's not Zion Williamson. He's not Marvin Bagley, and that's fine, but he was fantastic. He was a very, very, very good basketball player. Say what you will about him. Um, you know, Duke needed him. Duke was 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 not a very good team with Kyle Filipowski off the floor this season. And that's a fact. Uh he was necessary for their success, whether he was putting the ball in the basket or not. And so there's that. And that's kind of my rant on be you know, be reasonable after you lose. I know it's difficult. It's a, it's it's hard. It's hard. And I don't want to get on my soapbox and act like I don't get mad when my teams lose and stuff like that. Um but Cause you know, obviously that's just being a fan. Just don't be like, don't be like, I want this guy to leave. I want this guy off the team, blah, blah, you know, yada, yada, yada. Uh, don't, don't, you know, come on. But on, on that note of guys leaving and staying, well, we have had our, the first ever 
transfer portal entry from uh, the John Shire era. Christian Reeves entered the transfer portal to nobody's surprise. Uh, for me, when I look at Reeves, he's got such upside, but he was just never going to get any run at Duke, which is a shame. I hate that we'll never get to see the the immaculate Christian Reeves countdown to craziness performances. To me, he was kind of Josh Harrison 2.0 in that in that sense. But seven foot one with great length, solid shot blocking, I think can be a score above the rim. I, I look at kind of a Syracuse model of play as they they seem to always get a kind of guy like that that's seven one former three star something and he cooks pretty well. So I I think that you know Christian Reeves can fit into a system and a high major like that and do very well. I I think that it was the correct decision. Uh, as much as I hate to lose any player on the roster, I think it was the correct decision for him. And I think there might be some other players. Uh, well, spe- spe- specifically one other that it would be the correct decision for them to tr- to maybe uh, test the portal. Uh, and I'm going to get into that right now, actually. Who do I think is staying? Who do I think's going? Who do I have no clue about? That's that's <laughs> that's that's what it's looking like. Duke has six players coming in, right? Two seniors are out. Reeves is out. That's three scholarships freed up. You got to have at least three more. Go at least, right? I have I have pre-made edits for every single player on the roster staying, and I have six pre-made transfer uh, ones and five pre-made NBA draft ones, just in case for any scenario that I think can feasibly happen. Basically, I have edits made and graphics made to go out uh, when, when news breaks. Um, and so uh, let, me, let, me, let me get into it, I guess. Let's start with the easiest, the, the guy that we know is going to be the fourth guy out the door, and that's Kyle Filipowski. Kyle's not coming back. He's... he's, he's done what I don't think he accomplished quite what he wanted to accomplish at Duke but I think that he was the guy for two years and he fell a little bit short of those expectations but this is a weak draft this is his opportunity to be a lottery pick you know he turned down being 15 to 20 now he gets to be 10 to 15 he's moved up a a little bit in mock drafts and I think this is his time this is the time he needs to go Uh, he did terrifically but he needs this is this is Kyle's time to enter the NBA draft. He'll be the fourth guy. That's pretty obvious to me. I think that I, I never I'd never like proclaiming that I expect a player to enter the portal because it almost feels like we're forcing a guy out, and I never want to do that. But it is my expectation that Jaden Shute enters the transfer portal. Uh, I can't imagine why he wouldn't, because I mean maybe I don't know, but. You never know. I guess if other guys that I don't expect to leave, leave, then it would make more sense for him to stay. But when you look at who's coming in, when you look at how good Darren Harris has looked, despite his ranking, and then uh, Canapel and and Evans all playing basically the same position, not to mention the possibility of TJ Power returning, it's sort of like, where does Jaden shoot fine time on this basketball team? And I don't think he can. I don't think he can. I think he might be better suited somewhere else. Um, again, as unfortunate as that is. So if you get, you know, Filipowski and shoot join, that's five scholarships freed up. You'd only have to have one more. I'm of the opinion that I don't think Jeremy Roach is coming back. I think he sort of played out his college career. I, I, I kind of agree with, with that sentiment. I think he's played out his college career. I think there's a world in which he comes back. Um, but that would be based on the departures of a couple or one or a couple of guys that I think are going to come back. And I'll get into that in a second. But I do think Roach is out. And so with that, that gives you the six. No one else has to leave at this point. Right. But that's probably not going to be the case. Uh, I think here's the biggest question marks. I, I'm going to go out on a limb. I think I've seen a lot of people say Jalen Blakes is going to transfer, and I, I wouldn't be like surprised to see Jalen Blakes transfer or anything. My official pr- projection is a Jalen Blakes return to get his degree at Duke, and then like I see Jalen Blakes playing basically the same role. He's going to find minutes. People are like, well, look at all the freshmen coming in and this and that. There's no way he ever sees the floor. I mean, we thought that this year too. Like He just dude's a dog. He finds his way onto the floor. Um, I do think he's going to return. I, I think we could be wrong about that. I could, or I could be wrong about that though. Certainly wouldn't be surprised to see him enter the portal given, you know, how many minutes he does play already. But 
Here are the biggest question marks for Duke next season. Tyrese Proctor and Mark Mitchell. Those are the two, 100% the two largest question marks. And then to a bit of a lesser degree, TJ Power. And then there's a tiny little baby question mark on Jared McCain, right? There's a tiny little question mark on Jared. Because I think Jared loves Duke so much. And we saw it when he was, you know, breaking down in tears. In, in the in the press conference and just thanking John and his teammates for for believing in him so much. And I think Duke fans love this guy so much. And there's certainly NIL incentive for him to return to Duke. I'm not sure what that number is. I imagine it's pretty good. Um, obviously, he'd make more in the NBA. And right now, a lot of people think he can be a lottery pick in the NBA. And that's tough to pass down because I don't know that that's going to be the case next year. It's a much stronger draft class next year. So I don't know that he is ever going to have the chance to be a lottery pick again. It's difficult to turn that down right now. And I think he has an NBA game. I think he's better suited to play NBA basketball than he is to play college basketball. His game fits the league very well. And so I think that it's going to be difficult I, I didn't group him in with Kyle because I think there is a chance that Jared McCain comes back. I don't think it is a, a high chance, and I do think that he is going to go to the NBA. I do believe that. And so for me, it comes down to there's three major decisions. I also, I, there's another guy I haven't mentioned, Sean Stewart. I think Stewart's back. I think Stewart's back. I think Duke's going to get six players back probably maybe they're going to get five or six they're going to get five or six and here's the five that i'm confident in i already said jalen blakes right i already said blakes is one i'm confident i'm not actually that confident but i think he's back stewart i'm very con i'm the most confident that sean stewart is coming back and then caleb foster i've seen a lot of sprinkles of rumors about foster Entering the transfer portal. I think if he does, I think that's a leverage tactic and I think he'll still come back at the end of the day. Um, I expect Caleb Foster to be back and I expect him to most likely be a starting backcourt player unless Jared McCain comes back, in which case he'd have to come off the bench. And I'll get into why that is probably in a second, unless uh, something else happens that I don't expect. Um, but I don't think Foster's leaving. He's. I, just loves Duke. I think that Foster's going to stay. Obviously, there's so many more wild cards now, though, in today's transfer portal. It's so much more difficult to project these things. But I got Blake staying, Stewart staying, Foster staying. I've got Tyrese Proctor staying, which I think a lot of people, some people might disagree with. But I think, I think when you look at Tyrese Proctor, it's like what I don't think there's a better scenario for him anywhere else in college through the portal. I don't think he'd get he wouldn't get drafted, uh, but he would next year, and I firmly believe that. You know, there was a reason why scouts liked him as a potential lottery pick preseason. Now he played his way out of that, but very much out of that. But I think that there's a reason that was there. Look at Wendell Moore, man. Wendell Moore coming into his freshman year, people are like, this could be an NBA draft pick, and then at the end of the year, no one's going to draft this guy now. And then before a sophomore year, people are like, yeah, this, this is a guy that could be a top 20 pick. And then after a sophomore year, everybody's like, oh, we're not going to, you know, this isn't a guy we're going to draft. Before his junior year, you know, people were like, I don't really know about Wendell Moore. I, I probably wouldn't draft him. By the end of the year, first round pick. Sometimes it's just, you know, developing and finding the team that helps you shine uh, with scouts. And I think next year's team is the team that will help Tyrese Proctor garner that level of attention he needs to reassert himself as a first round pick. When you think about this team, Proctor is a very good passer, I think, uh, down low as especially. And this team wasn't designed to help Tyrese Proctor highlight his passing package, one, uh, and just inflate his assist numbers. They were very much lower than they should have been. I think that he hit a bit of a sophomore slump. I think that he'll have a much better season offensively speaking as a more confident guard when he is probably the lead guard next season i think jeremy you know jeremy roach jared mccain you know there's there were so many uh point guard combo guard players on this team that he often took a back seat i think on next year's team he will probably be the lead offensive guard 
uh, assuming McCain's not there, and he'll have you know free range of that. But then he'll also have Cooper Flag and Kamon Malawatch to throw lobs to, to have post feeds to for for a lot of assist numbers. And I think he will shine on next year's team with a return. I think it would be a wise decision. That is my opinion. I got Proctor back. For me, the, the, the two biggest question marks, TJ Power. Will TJ Power enter the transfer portal? I don't know. Honestly, I think I'm like 50-50 on that one, and I'm not going to make uh, an assertive claim on it. The other guy who I'm really, really unconfident on, the only guy that I'm really unconfident about is Mark Mitchell. I think it makes sense for Mitchell to come back. I, I love the idea of him returning to play the three again. Uh, I think he was a bit out of out of sync and out of position. He looked a lot better as a three as a freshman. But there were times where it, it looked frustrating for Mitchell, especially like in the NCAA tournament and his role looked weird and he didn't play as much as he did earlier in the year. And there are those kind of things that have made me think that mm, maybe the portal is where Mark Mitchell's going. And I also wouldn't be surprised if we got sort of a he's entering both the portal and the draft kind of thing. He won't get drafted, but enter just for feedback, obviously. Uh, And I don't know, because I think that obviously there's the people that are like, well, Mitchell just won't play. He just won't start. That's not true. If Mark Mitchell comes back, he will start. He will be the starting small forward or power forward, depending on how they play. He and Cooper flag. No doubt about it. He's a two year starter that started almost every single game of his entire career. He will start. Uh, zero doubts. Evans would come off the bench in, in that scenario. And so playing time, I don't think that that's an issue. I think it's just, does, you know, it, does he feel right at Duke still? Is the fit right still? Uh, that kind of thing. It's, it, is he getting the right vibes? Is It's going to be something like a, a feeling kind of issue, not, not a playing time type of issue if Mitchell were to decide to decide to leave. Obviously, the best case scenario for Duke is to get, well, I mean, McCain, Proctor, and Mitchell back would be the best case scenario, but that's a very unlikely one. I think for Duke, what you want that lineup to look like is Tyrese Proctor, Caleb Foster, Mark Mitchell, Cooper Flagg, and Kamon Malawatch, although it would not obviously be the end of the world if Mitchell were not there and Evans were starting. In that scenario, they'd have to hit the portal for a supporting guy off the bench. I'm very anti using the portal. I don't love it. I like keeping a lot of guys around. Other people are going to say that, well, you need that experience from the portal, but I, I don't know. I mean, hold on to Mitchell, hold on to Proctor. You got two uh, juniors that, that, you know, they know how to hoop, man, and they've been around. And I think that would be very important. I like the continuity and I like the, the keeping the, the guys you recruited out of high school. That's always better to me. And you can say one strategy works more than the other. Every single player in state's rotation is a transfer, and UConn has three transfers in its starting lineup. Blah, blah. You know, whatever. I mean, Duke made the Elite Eight, right? And if they had a good shooting day, they were in the Final Four with no transfers in or out last season. And so you can say one, this is just the way college basketball is now. You have to kill it in the port. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. I think it's just a complete, you know, team to team kind of thing. And it's, it's more of a reflection of just how Dukes, these individual Duke teams are playing than the overall system. I don't think you have to own the transfer portal to win a national championship anymore. I think that it's, it's, it can be a a big help, but if you're not losing a ton of your team to the portal, I don't think you need to gain a lot of your roster from the portal. And in Duke's case, I don't see them losing that much to the portal. I could be wrong. I could I could be sitting here in shambles in like a week or two if like Mark Mitchell and Tyrese Proctor both enter the transfer portal. In that scenario, I don't see how you avoid, you know, having to utilize the portal in some sort of significant manner. But I think I think the tendency should be to avoid significant usage until you have to. But be prepared to use it because you never know. There's so many unpredictabilities. Uh, in terms of the portal now. And so that's kind of where I stand. Um, Obviously, I'm going to be wrong about a lot of things. I might be right about a couple. That's just how it is. It's not easy to predict these things, um, especially now. But Duke's team next year is, is, is a very interesting one. I've had a lot of people, you know, tell me, you know, it's fine. Duke's losing the Elite Eight. Um, Next year, they got the Toon Squad coming in. Like, they're going to be amazing. 
And I'm like, come on, man. Like, let's, we need to see who comes back because as good as this freshman class is, I, I, I they're 17, a lot of them, uh, especially the better ones. And there's a lot of question marks around Gongba and injuries. And then it's just like, I don't know, you know, the freshmen aren't going to get it done themselves. They've got to have guy like good player, good players return, experienced starter players return. And if you're ruling out Filipowski back, if we don't think we're getting Roach back, we don't think we're getting McCain back. All the attention and who Duke needs to get back is on Tyrese Proctor and Mark Mitchell. Those are the two main guys, but then also Caleb Foster as well. Or huge get backs. I think Sean Stewart's a big get back as well. But I'm less worried about him uh, in terms of departing. So, yeah, there's that. And obviously, in the coming weeks, we'll be talking a whole lot about the departures and the stings and whatever. And it's going to draw out for a million years uh, with this whole process. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. The last thing I want to talk about is that incoming freshman class. Obviously, there was just the McDonald's All-American game. With Cooper Flag and Isaiah Evans. I love Isaiah Evans as a smack talker, dude, is the ultimate troll. But he and Cooper Flag, I love their confidence. I love their cockiness. And I love that they're they're these tough guys that aren't afraid of the moment. I, I love that. And I think that's something Duke really needs. And I think that's something that at times Duke lacked this season. And Cooper Flag actually, in an interview with Jason Jordan, sort of pointed that out. That, that Duke, you know, they, this was before Duke lost, I think before they even played Houston. He said if, if Duke showed a little more physicality and they were a little tougher, that they'd be all right because they've got the talent. And he said, you know, at times that, that they lacked that. He's right about that. He's right about that. And I think they were, and I think even in that like Duke UNC SmackDown, they were talking about how, you know, those guys didn't have like the, the same toughness that, that he and Isaiah had. And I think that, you know, and there, there are certain times where he might be a little, a little bit right, but he also needs to realize, like, you're playing with those guys next year, man. Like, don't, don't, don't be throwing them under the bus because those are your teammates next season. Like, let's come on now. Um, but it should be a fun season and a very interesting off season, I think, that, I, that I'm looking forward to. And and let me say that 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 I'm very impressed and proud of this past Duke team, whether anyone else is or not. Uh, a lot of people said this Duke team could lose to Vermont and then they beat them. And a lot of people, very popular pick, said James Madison's going to take them out and then they beat them. And then they said, oh, of course they beat them. All they did was just play a 13 and a 12 seed. I thought you picked them to lose, right? But now it's, oh, the easy path to the Sweet 16. And then it's like Duke's playing Houston. Now oh, they got no chance. Houston's designed to beat them. They've got this really great defense. There's just no chance for Duke. They're not going to win this game. And then they win the game and it's, oh, well, it's only because Jamal shed. Duke's not actually good anymore. Uh, And it's like, dude, come on. They made the Elite Eight. Only 24 Duke teams of all time have done it. And I can tell you right now, there's been a whole lot more than 24 Duke teams of all time. So that is an impressive feat no matter what you believe. This team did well. Uh, You might not purchase an Elite Eight t-shirt, but it's a pretty good finish. They didn't hang any banners, but it's a pretty good finish, right? And there's a lot to be proud of, and there's a lot to build upon. And in his first two years, John Shire has delivered an ACC tournament championship and an Elite Eight, and I don't think that's too shabby. We're in for a roller coaster of an offseason in terms of who stays and who goes, and I'm sure that's what I'll be talking about the next time I, I hop on this mic again. Thanks so much for, for listening, and I hope I, uh, you don't disagree with some of my takes too much. Uh, I really appreciate you guys listening throughout the entire season. Obviously, this is not the end of the Duke Wisdom Podcast. It will remain as regular slash irregular, actually probably more regular, going down the line because uh, I graduate in May, and so that'll bring some more regularity to, to, to my life. But Thanks so much for listening throughout this first season uh, that I've done this podcast for. It means so much that you guys take the times out of your day to listen to me just talking to a mic. I've got big things planned for this podcast, including hopefully trying to improve audio quality, getting a better mic, trying to get people on episodes with me, organizing guests. It is amazing to me that, that I've had the play that I've had 
for 40, almost 40 episodes now of just me talking. And I, I literally like the first couple episodes, I was like, I'm going to have people on. And so I'm sorry that I've now recorded 40 of these things with my own deranged speaking by myself. Um, but I think that I am a hundred percent certain going to try to get people to buy in and be on this podcast with me and, and have some fun, especially during the off season with, with just some crazy speculation or whatever, or, or some trivia games or whatever, whatever I'll get into on here. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And if that sounds like something you want to be a part of, you know, I had the little ad read every episode. Go, go check out the, the Duke Wisdom Network. DukeWisdom.org slash join network. Fill out that form, man. Join us. We got a Slack channel. It's a lot of fun. Uh, plus, you can take part in ranking the players for their postseason rankings, maybe, and saying who you think is going to come and go. That's something we're working on right now. Um, anyway, thank you for so much for listening to this episode and for the whole season. It's time for the, for the off season, guys. I'll talk to you later.